Hi you guys, welcome back to another video. It is Shamira, and we are going to be doing another what it's like coding in the real world. This time I have some more cases for you guys and the video is a lot longer than last time. So if you guys have not watched video one, I will leave that in the cards above and maybe somewhere at the end of the video, but let's just jump right into this video. So here we are with our first case. And it says the patient was admitted to the hospital with brief history of postmenopausal bleeding. An ultrasound had revealed findings of a thickened cystic endometrium. And the patient presents for HDNC, which is a hysteroscopy and dilation and curatage. So we have pre op diagnosis and post op. Those both are the same. And then we get into the findings and the procedure. So the findings. Mm, I skim through there and I don't see anything that um, stands out to me. For the procedure, we have the patient was taken to the OR where MAC anesthesia was found to be adequate. Um, placed in dorsolotomy position. A speculum was placed. Tenaculum was applied. And uterus sounded to 12 centimeters. The hysteroscope was placed. And the cavity was dilated, multiple polypoid thickened areas, and it says what appeared to be a uterine. Oh my gosh, I looked up how to pronounce this word earlier, and it was sneaky. No, sen. Damn it, it's pronounced senekye. It was sneaky. Gay? Sinike? I'm not sure. I forget. The hysteroscope was removed from the uterus and a small sharp crit was used to correct each quadrant of the uterus and the specimen was obtained. Tenaculin was removed and good hemostasis was noted. So what we did here was a hysteroscopy and DNC we dilated and curetted. So in your CPT manual, you are going to be in the female genital system and I actually have a tab for hysteroscopies so I can use this tab here and once I get to the laparoscopy and hysteroscopy section I will just go through until I find the hysteroscopies which is here but this one is for diagnostic only so then we come up here and it says hysteroscopy with sampling biopsy of endometrium or and or polypectomy with or without DNC. And I have this here because sometimes the documentation will say they use the myosure for the hysteroscopy and DNC. So I wrote that in my book just so I can, you know, have it for when I was training. And yes, yeah, so this is the CPT code that we are going to be looking at, 58558. And pathology actually gave us um, nothing. So polypoi fragments of disordered proliferative endometrium, that is not a diagnosis code that you will find or diagnoses that you will find in your ICD-10 book. So you will um, result back to the post-op diagnosis codes, which is the dysfunctional uterine bleeding and the thickened endometrium. But there was something that did stand out to me because if I were to use this dysfunctional uterine bleeding and the thickened endometrium, um, I don't think those diagnosis codes are going to be in my coding companion, but I will confirm those in a second. So what I wanted to pull out was this here where it says that uterine synechia is what we are going to see if we can find a diagnosis for. So in my ICD-10 book, I am going to look for the S's. Oh wait, we're going the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so S-Y-N-E right here where it says, where's my pencil? Right here, intrauterine traumatic N85.6. So I'm going to write that code down. That's our first one. And then we need to look up the dysfunctional uterine bleeding and the thickened endometrium. 
which is, let's go this way for the thicken since we're already kind of close to it. And where we see it, right here where it says thickening endometrium R9389. And then for the dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Um, let me look up dysfunction. Even though I don't think that's it's going to give me what I need when I go there. But let's just go there. Dysfunction. Oh, it sure did. Dysfunction. And then where did I see it at? Bleeding uterus, N93.8. Okay, so I have all of those. And when it comes to how do you know how to link them, I normally always put the R diagnosis codes last. So I would say I'll have this one third, and now I need to figure out which one I want to have first, either this one or this one. And I don't think it really matters which one you would put first. But sometimes what I like to do is I will grab my coding companion, and this is um, the ob coding companion book. And I will look up my code that I'm billing, which is 58558. 58558. And then from here, they give um, the explanation of the procedure. They also give some coding tips. But um, if I don't need to read any of that, I come here strictly for the diagnosis codes. So we have N85-6 and N93-8. So N85-6, that is a code that we can use for this CPT. And the other one was N93.8. And that is also on here. And this one says other specified. So um, when it comes to N93.8, this is an other code. And then the N85.6 is not an other code. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to link this as this is my first one. This is my second one. And my CPT code is the 58558. And that is what we have for this first case. Moving on to my next question. We have a patient was admitted to the hospital with brief history of undesired fertility. Patient now presents for laparoscopic, um, what is this, bilateral fulguration sterilization. And pre-op and post-op say encounter for tubal ligation. Patient was prepped in dorsoplotomy position. Sterile catheter was placed in her bladder. Anterior liposurfix was well visualized and grasped with a temaculum. And gloves were changed, attention turned to the abdomen at this time. So once my um, physician or provider here decided to change the gloves and we are now moving up top, we are no longer um, at the in between the patient's legs. This is going to be a laparoscopic procedure. So when you read these um, operative reports, make sure you pay attention to that because you don't want to think that this procedure is done through the... Um, vagina if they're telling you that they're changing their gloves and now they're moving to the patient's abdomen where we are going to be placing the um, scopes to perform the procedure. So uh, the umbilicus was everted and I like to look for certain terms. I'm going to show you guys what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so right here where it says the skin incisions, so we made eight millimeter skin incisions, so that's very, very small. That's also going to tell you that this is not a open procedure, meaning cutting the patient completely open. Also, um, when you see carbon dioxide or oxygen being used to insufflate the abdomen, if you have an open procedure, you should not need to um, be filling the peritoneum with oxygen because it's already open. So I look for those. Also look for trochers. And let me see. 
It says diagnostic laparoscopy was carried out and a normal uterus, bilateral fallopian tubes and ovaries were visualized. So when you have a laparoscopic or a surgical laparoscopic procedure, the diagnostic laparoscopy is always included. And I mentioned this in a previous video of mine. I, I don't know if I'm going to put that part in this video. I may or may not, depending on if I feel like searching for it on the web, but it'll tell you that diagnostic laparoscopy is always included in surgical laparoscopy, and it also says it in your CPT book. However, there are situations where you can bill a diagnostic with a surgical, or is it diagnostic with open? I can't remember which one it is, so I might have to pull it up so I can show you guys what that says. But anyway, moving on, um, fallopian tubes were identified bilaterally, and um, let me see here. Desiccated occluded. This initial burn site was followed by three continuous burn sites along with the length of the tube. So we are not removing the tubes, but we are burning them. And that is a type of ligation that we are going to be doing. Um, let me see. That was for which side? I think that was for the left side. Oh, no. And it says, in the exact same fashion, the left fallopian tube was identified, followed out to its vibrated end, and grasped in the mid-isthmic isthmic portion. The initial burn site was followed by three continuous burn sites along the length of the fallopian tube. And laparoscope instruments were removed. Peritoneum was deflated. Look, now it's deflated, meaning we are releasing and getting rid of all that air that we have put in there. And umbilical sleep carefully removed to avoid herniation. And we're pretty much done at this point. We are closing her up. Well, not closing her up, but stitching, um, suturing those small incisions that we had made. And it says, I then went below to remove the vaginal instrumentation. Excellent hemostasis was noted. Catheter was noted to be draining a small amount of clear urine and was removed. So in my CPT manual, if I'm in the female genital system, I want to go to laparoscopy, but you want to be for the OV ducts and ovaries, which is here. And you want to see laparoscopy. And right here is where I was telling you guys, surgical laparoscopy always includes diagnostic laparoscopy. So we would not bill this code. Is it this one? No, diagnostic laparoscopy is 49320. We would not bill that with this code. And we are going to be looking at this 58670 because per ACOG, if the tubes are not completely removed, then we need to build the fulguration of oviducts. And I have a note here for elective sterilization. Um, now, before we were billing this when they removed the tubes, but we recently, I think within the last 30 days, was it we have received guidance that we need to bill this one if they removed the tubes. But if they're just cutting them, burning them, tying them, we are billing 58670. So for my CPT code, I'm going to bill 58670. And then when it comes to my um, ICD-10, I actually am not sure because of how I looked it up, but we're just gonna look for sterilization. So I'm going to look here. And I want to, actually it might be under encounter. Yeah, it might be under encounter, but I'm going to see. Yep, sterilization, see encounter for sterilization. So now I need to look for encounter, which I should have that tabbed, but I don't, because I rarely look for it, um, encounter codes. So once we get to encounter, I'm looking right here, sterilization Z30.2. So for this one, my codes that I'm going to report is 
Z30.2 for the sterilization, and then 58670 for um, the CPT. And I just realized, did we not go over, the, we did not even look up those other codes. Oh my gosh, you guys. And I feel like I kind of did that because I had already confirmed them. These are cases that I already did, so I already know um, <laughs> what what's excluded and what isn't. So I apologize for not showing you guys those codes. So let me go to N85-6 and N9389 quick, just to show you guys, because I wanted to tell you guys something and I completely forgot. So when we are at N85 endometrial hyperplasia, um, I'm looking for any excludes notes and it tells me that we exclude N80 and 71 86 and 88 and my other N code was an N93 so we are good to report the N85.6 and now I'm going to go to N93 and N93 it does not tell me that I can't use the N85 so looking for N93.8 which is right here and I get no excludes. So those two codes are good. And then that R code that I have, which is the R, R9389 for the thickened endometrium. And I mean, R93.8 up here. Abnormal findings on diagnostic imaging of other specified body structure. This is what they told me to use for that thickened endometrium. So that's why I'm using that one, even though it doesn't say anything about thickened endometrium. But that's what they told me to use. So that's why we're using that. And then for this case that we are doing for this tubal ligation, I will look for Z30.2 and counter for sterilization. And I also have it written there. So, yeah, first two cases done. Moving on to our third. For our third one, we have patient was admitted to the hospital with brief history of abnormal pap. Colposcopy revealed findings of SIN2 of the ectocervix, and the patient now presents for LEAP. So, pre op and post op are for SIN2, and patient was taken to the operating room. Conducted a timeout. She's in dorsal thotomy position. A weighted speculum was placed. Paracervical block was performed. A large loop was used to perform the leap. So that's very important um, to know. The specimen was started at the right and carried across the left side. The leap was complete. And the specimen was obtained in one specimen. Um... The ectocervix was cauterized with ball cautery, taking care to avoid the endocervic canal. An ECC was performed and small specimen collected and sent on Telfa, which I had to look up that because I wasn't sure what that was, but that is like the little um, gauze, I guess, um, that come in like the little packaging that looks like a sanitary um, napkin. So I was, I was like, wow, they actually put specimens on that? Interesting. Um, the cervix was again cauterized with the ball cautery, and that's pretty much it. So we have a large loop that was used to perform this leap, and we did an ECC. So here is pathology, and it says endocervix curettings, rare detached atypical squamous cells present, uh, suspicious for dysplasia. Anything that's suspicious or consistent with or possible I do not code um, unless it's confirmed. And then we have right here the cone biopsy. It says focal high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion with coilocytosis, SIN2 and HPV present in one block and in the background of the squamous metaplasia. Dysplasia reaches the peripheral inked margin of the endocervix and ectocervix in deep margins free of involvement. So we're not going to worry about this section here because it just says that it's free of any, any involvement. Dysplasia reaches the peripheral inked margin 
And if I were to go to dysplasia or squamous metaplasia, it tells me to go to dysplasia. So we are going to, for this first ICD-10 code, actually let's do CPT first. Let's look up for our large loop um, leap procedure. And I don't think I have a tab for that, but that's just a few pages right here. Um, I was gonna say it's a few pages back. So once you get to the cervix uteri, so these are gonna be procedures on the cervix. Corpus uteri is for the uterus. So cervix uteri, excisions, and this was a colonization of the cervix, but we did not use a cold knife or laser. We used the loop electrode excision, which is why I have leap here. And I have a note that says includes 57505, which is the ECC, the endocervical curatage. So I cannot bill 57522 N for the ECC because it's included. So our CPT code is going to be 57522. And now we need to look up these diagnoses. So what I'm going to look up first is the SIN2. And I just go to SIN. Okay, so right here where it says sin, it says to see neoplasia intraepithelial cervix. So that's going to be right before I get to my neoplasm table. And that's usually where I always go. But I wanted to show you guys that it's going to tell me to go somewhere else. So whenever I see sin or um, what's the other one? If I see ain or if I see um, what vein, then... I always come right before the neoplasm table and I have some information here just to explain what the headings or the uh, things up here. So like for uncertain behavior, unspecified, I put information here to kind of like help me to figure out what pathology is talking about. But anyway, we need to be looking at SIN1 or is it SIN2? This is for SIN2, so we need to look at SIN, which is the cervix. It's said to go to neoplasia, intraepithelial, cervix, grade 2, N87-1. So, uh, right here, N87-1. And then we also saw HPV. Um, if you were to go to metaplasia, let me just show you guys. It's one page back. So if you were to go to metaplasia cervix squamous, it will tell you to see dysplasia cervix. So when you do that, and you go to dysplasia, Okay, so once you get to dysplasia, you'll see it says cervix. And then here is what it told me earlier, just a few minutes ago when we were looking at 10, it told us about the zero, the one, and if it was a three, it would be the D069. So if you want, you can put here for sin one is mild, sin two is moderate, sin three is severe. So you could have found that information here as well because you see moderate is the same thing for that N87 one that we wrote down. So now all we have to do is look up that HPV and how I'm going to find that is I'm going to look up human for human papule various virus, however you say it. <laughs> um, here, human papillomavirus, uh, pap, human pap, okay? And we are going to look for the high risk in this case. The only reason why I'm choosing the high risk cervix R87810 is because I had confirmed in pathology the patient did have a um, 
her pap test done and it did come back positive. So that's why I had used this one, it, R87810. But if I didn't, and if it was just like um, HPV and I did not have the high risk, I would have used, I would have just gone to, where is it? I think it's here. Um, pat, pat, pat. Okay, so I would have looked up this code here, this B97.7 for the PAP as a cause of disease classified elsewhere. And that's some of that's the code that some of the, my physicians do use. But if I see that we tested her and she was positive and it was high risk for the cervix, I use the R8710. But if I don't get that much information, then I will resort to this B97.7. But this code cannot be primary. I think I think this code can't be primary. It needs another code um, because you're saying this virus is a cause from something else. So you need to have that something else in order to use this code. So for this third case, um, we use the 57522 for our LEAP. And then this is my primary diagnosis and my secondary diagnosis code. And if I wanted to, I can show you guys those in my coding companion, 575, 575, 575, 22. We're almost there, here we are. 57522, and this is for the colonization. I'm going to look for my N87-1, which is right here moderate cervical dysplasia, and you see that my R code is not on here. So I don't have to have it, but I'm just going to put it on the claim because that's what it said on pathology. So yeah. Okay, so moving on to our next page, I actually have three procedures listed here. We're going to go one by one. Um, I wanted to try and put a lot on one page versus having just this one procedure on one page and then jumping to another page. So for the first procedure on this page, we, it says patient presents to the office for cervical polyp removal, ring forcep placed on the cervical polyp tissue, gently twisted forceps until polyp was removed, placed in specimen container, there was some bleeding, silver nitrate used, patient tolerated procedure well. And pathology came back and said that it was in fact an endocervical polyp. So um, when it comes to our CPT, we're actually already where we need to be coming off from that LEAP procedure. If you just go up, we are actually going to use the 57500 biopsy of cervix because it says a single or multiple or local excision of a lesion and I have noted removal of a cervical polyp right on top. So I know that I need to be using this code. So even though it's not listed as a um, cervical biopsy procedure, it's the same thing. So our CPT code is 57500. And my ICD-10, it said that it was an endocervical polyp. So I'm just going to move my coding companion and I'm going to look for, oh, we're already at the piece, so I just need to get to follow up. M-N-O. I always recite the alphabet sometimes. And right up here, it says polyp cervix, and this one was for the cervix, right? Endocervical polyp. Yep, endocervix. So N84.1. And if I go over there, okay, so N84.1 polyp of cervix uteri, endocervix. And that is where we are. We are in the cervix uteri section in our CPT manual, and we did a removal of the polyp. 
So N84.1 is going to be our one and only diagnosis code for this procedure. And that was our fourth case. So moving to number five, we have, um, let's see, LSIL. So that is going to be low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. We're doing a CULP with cervical biopsy and ECC. It says the speculum was placed in the vagina. Colposcopic examination of the transitional zone was seen. The endocervix was curated using the Kevorkian curette. A cervical biopsy was also performed with the biopsy punch. And patient tolerated the procedure well. The comment, she says, normal findings encountered. Representative biopsies obtained at 12 and 6, but no significant change noted. ECC is obtained as well. Patient notes that last intercourse was three months ago, and LMP is 9-1. So our pathology says the biopsies were from 12 and 6. There was low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, SIN-1, and the curettings that we did, there was nothing found. So we need to report the low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion and SIN-1. And remember, when you have those SIN1s, I think the LSIL is also there. So I'm going to go back to where my um, neoplasm table starts. And oh, just passed it right here. So I don't see the LSIL, but we do see SIN. And that is going to be here. And this one was a SIN1. So N87.0 and did we look up the, no, we didn't even look up the CPT code. So we're still working on the cervix uteri and this time we're doing an endoscopy type of procedure. So a colposcopy of the cervix is this one, but we did a culp with a biopsy and ECC. So you'll see that these are actually kind of like indented. So this, or I should say this, is included in this. So our CPT code is going to be the 57454. 57454. And um, when it comes to that LSIL, if you just go over there, and it's actually LGSIL. And then it tells me the cervix is R87612. And if you go to the R87612, you will find... These excludes one's notes up here, and I have it highlighted that SIN1, SIN2, and SIN3 are excludes ones for this code. So we cannot use this R code with our N code. So the N87.0 is going to be the only code that we use for our colposcopy, biopsy, and ECC procedure. Okay, and our third one that we have down here is a circumcision. It says a timeout was completed before the actual procedure. The infant was securely positioned on the circumcision board. Penis and scrotum was cleansed with alcohol and a dorsal penal nerve block was given with two injections. And let's just skip through. Foreskin was clamped at each side of the meatus. Dorsal clamp was applied and foreskin divided with scissors. The foreskin was retracted over the glands and adhesion sleeves with a probe. The gamaco clamp was applied and tightened. So we need to pay attention to the fact that we used a clamp. The gamaco clamp was removed and the area was cleansed. Petroleum covered sterile gauze pad and um, procedure was tolerated well. Infant male was left with the nurse in attendance. So for this procedure, we are not going to be in the female genital section. We need to go to the males. So I have a tab for males. And once we get there, we are already in the penis section. You want to look for excision. And up here is where I have these circumcisions. 
And the difference between, I have it blocked in for the two, but it's actually for the three, is the age for these two. So if the patient is 28 days or younger, you will be looking at this one if they used a method other than a clamp, but for ours, we use the clamp. And this one is for older than 28 days of age. But um, the CPT code that we're gonna be using is the 54150 because we did use a clamp and it was used with a dorsal penal block. That was in our documentation. And I actually have the, um, the diagnosis code that I use um, already there to not have to look it up every single time. But now I actually know it off memory. So I don't even have to go to this section in my CPT book. But the ICD-10 is Z41.2 and then our CPT is 54150. And then that other note that I have here is for Medicaid products or um, payers, they always want the um, Z38 point code for PA, for Pennsylvania. Um, they want this code first before I were to use that. So that's what that message is. You guys don't have to worry about writing that unless you are a coder in Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, let me see. I think if you were to look that up in your ICD-10 book, though, you would just go to Encounter... And once you get there, you will look for um, encounter for where is my I don't see it at encounter. I don't see where it says circumcision. So you actually might have to go to circumcision. So let me see. Right here. Circumcision in the absence of a medical indication, ritual routine, Z41.2. And then you would then have to go over there in the back of your book. Look how my book what my book does sometimes when I flip so much. And then sometimes it'll like come off the track. Like my um, spiral here, it'll, the pages will come loose, but it's okay. So Z41.2, encounter for routine and ritual male circumcision. So that is our code. And then we don't have to worry about any other codes. So yeah, that was case number one, two, three, six. So moving along, we have, I think, two more to go. So I have here, patient was admitted to the hospital for a vaginal hysterectomy with a bilateral salpingectomy for abnormal uterine bleeding and a history of cervical dysplasia. We have our pre-op and post-op diagnoses and it says patient was taken to the OR where she was correctly identified and the procedure verified. Uh, weighted speculum was placed. Cervix was circumferentially injected with diluted whatever that is. And posterior cul-de-sac was easily entered sharply. Um, oh, that's what I wanted to make sure you guys pay attention because remember the other one? We change the gloves and we move to the abdomen. With a vaginal hysterectomy, you're going to stay down there. And that's where the procedure is going to start. So right here where it says the cervix was circumferentially injected. And then was the same thing. Incised with a knife. The posterior cul-de-sac was easily entered sharply. And then the anterior cul-de-sac was also entered sharply. So we're doing this procedure down below. This is where we're doing our cutting. And the procedure starts here, what already started, but this is where you want to pay attention to. So the urosacral ligaments were clamped, cut, and doubly suture ligated. And when I first started coding for OB, I like to have these diagrams. So um, here is the uterosacral ligament. So we're, we already went through the vagina. We have the speculum in there. Um, the uterosacral ligament is here that we cut. First, 
And then, uh, let me see, it says a long weighted speculum was placed in the vagina. The cardinal ligaments were bilaterally clamped. And then we have the uterine vessels. So the cardinal ligament, which is here, they then cut this one and then they also cut the uterine blood vessels. So they're cutting this next. And as I would read, I would just pay attention to the um, areas that they're cutting or the ligaments that they're cutting. And um, as I do this over and over and over again, I no longer have to use this diagram. But I did want to show you guys, just so you guys kind of have a visual as we were reading. And um, then we have, after the cardinal, the uterine vessels, and then we have the round ligaments were clamped. And you'll see the round is here. So these ligaments that come out, those were cut. And then we have the broad ligament. So these ligaments here, the mesosalpinx, mesovarian, and mesometrium. So it's like this, uh, this back wing, I guess you can say, is what we are cutting through. And then you'll also see that we cut the utero, um, utero ovarian ligament, which is right here in between the uterus and the ovary. So where were we? Right here. Um, the round ligament and then uterus then exteriorized and the remaining broad ligaments, fallopian tube and utero ovarian ligament was clamped, cut and tied. And it says the left fallopian tube was then grasped and was seen in its entirety. It was cross clamped near the ovary and excised. A suture ligature was placed on that pedicle in a similar fashion, the right fallopian tube was identified. It was brought into the field. The distal fallopian tube was grasped and a partial salpingectomy was performed, including removal of the fimbriated end. And the cuff, the vaginal cuff sutures were placed and the uterosacral ligaments bilaterally incorporating the uterosacral ligaments. And the McCall suture was placed and this McCall suture is actually included in vaginal hysterectomies. So we would not bill for that separate, but I will show you guys what CPT code that is. The only time that we can bill for it per our um, coding department, leaders, managers, whatever, is when there is an extensive prolapse or an enteral seal. But this code is normally included or typically included in the vaginal hysterectomies and it's not billed separate. Um, and there is no enteral seal um, noted. So then it says the bladder was drained, fully catheter and clear urine was noted. Anterior peritoneum was grass, suture ligated. And this did keep the bowel above the vaginal cuff. The vaginal cuff was then closed, good hemostasis was noted, and the McCall stitch was now tied. Okay, patient tolerated procedure well. So for our CPT code, this was a vaginal hysterectomy. So we're going back over to our female genital system, and I'm going to come by my A&P repairs because I wanted to show you guys that McCall. And it's going to be here. McCall stitch is the 57283. But for our CPT code, we are going to be looking at our vaginal hysterectomies, which is here. And you will have to look at pathology in order to determine if you are using the 58260 or the 58290. Because if a uterus is 250 grams or more, you're using this section here. If, but if it is less, then you're using this section here. So for this question, we're just gonna say we did not have a weight. So we are going to go with the, um, actually no. We rem we're not gonna go with the 58260 because we removed the tubes, but we did not remove the ovaries. So um, let me see, when did we? And I don't think I have, no, I don't have pathology for this one, but we did cut and remove the tubes, which was mentioned in this procedure for a bilateral subjectomy. And we did in fact remove the tubes because we removed the entire left 
And then I think the right one was a partial salpingectomy. So even if we only removed partial of the right tube, you're still going to report the 58262. So 58262 is our CPT code. And for our ICD-10 codes, we are going to be looking for the menorrhagia and then the dyspareunia and then the cervical anemia. dysplasia. So for menorrhagia, we are going to Menorrhagia is right here, N92.0. So N92.0. And then we need to look for cervical dysplasia, which we were there before, but we need to go back to it now. Cervical dysplasia is N87.9. So N87.9. And we also have the dyspareunia, if I'm saying that right, which is actually on the same page. It is right over here. And females, N9410. So N9410. And what I did for this one is I confirmed those diagnosis codes. Well, we got to do it in ICD-10 first. So that way we know what excludes and what doesn't exclude. Okay, so N87... Where we need to look. N87 dysplasia. I don't see our N92 here, but this is the code that we were going to be using for the surgical for the cervical dysplasia, not otherwise specified. N879. And we need to then look for N92.0, which is over here. And it doesn't say that the other one excludes. So N92.0 is good. And then our last code is N9410. N9410, which is right here, unspecified. And there was an excludes one, but it's not with anything that we're using. And checking up here, we don't have anything up there as well. So when it came to me trying to figure out which one I wanted to put first, I went over to my coding companion. And I went to N82-62. which is here, and I'm going to look for my N. My first one is N92. I have that on there. N9410 is not on there. And then what about N879? The cervical dysplasia, dysplasia, that's also not on there, but the mild one is, and it wasn't confirmed that it was um, sin one. So I am going to list these as, how did I list them? I listed as one, two, and three. Or you could have listed one and then this two and then that three. But I think because this one, is this one? Yeah, they're both unspecified. So it really didn't matter which one I put first, but I like to put the unspecified ones towards the back and then ones that are specified as my first or primary diagnosis code. So that was case number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven 
Oh, we have eight cases. I don't know why I thought we had seven. Okay, moving on to our eighth and final case. This one actually is our last one. Um, yeah, because there goes pathology and there's nothing else past that. So um, looking at this one, patient is here for a vaginal hysterectomy with a bilateral salpingo oophorectomy, meaning we're taking the tubes and the ovaries. And this is also going to be with an anterior and posterior repair for pelvic organ prolapse. We have our pre and post-op diagnosis code. We have a cystal seal with uterine prolapse. And then we have a rectal seal. And um, normally we do get the codes on the um, op note like this. But I kept them on here because I wanted to show you guys something because we're actually not going to be using these codes. So even though you'll get an op note and you might you might see like, oh my gosh, post-op and post-op diagnosis codes and they're already there. Well, you have to read the documentation in order to know if you're going to be using those or not. And also pathology is the determining factor on what CP or what ICD-10 code you use. So um let me see here let's begin reading this procedure a weighted speculum was placed cervix was circumferentially incised with a knife posterior cul de sac was easily entered anterior cul de sac was easily entered the uterosacral ligaments were cut we also cut the cardinal ligaments the uterine vessels the round ligaments and the broad ligament, fallopian tube, and uterine ovarian ligament. And the right fallopian tube and ovary were grasped. And right here, cross clamped across the infunded below pelvic ligament. And I've said this in a previous video, whenever they're cutting this ligament, they're um, gonna be taking the ovary and the tube. So this was doubly suture ligated. And the left fallopian tube and ovary were identified and the same procedure was performed on the left. And then we have the vaginal cuff, angle sutures replaced, incorporating the uterosacral ligaments and that McCall suture was placed again, but it was not tied yet. And remember, this is included unless there was an ex extensive prolapse or um, what is it, an enteral seal. And we don't have an enteral seal. We have rectal seal and cystal seal. Cystal seal is a bladder prolapse, rectal seal is a rectum prolapse. Enteral seal is an intestines prolapse, meaning your intestines are falling into your vagina area. But for this patient, it's her bladder that's protruding into the vagina and the rectum that's also coming in through the vagina. So this was double suture ligated and the left tube, okay, we read that. Foley catheter and clear urine was noted. The anterior peritoneum was grasped. The anterior peritoneum was suture ligated to the posterior peritoneum. And let me see. This did effectively keep the bowel above the vaginal cuff. And then it says the anterior called pore feet was then performed. So we are done with the vaginal hysterectomy at this point. And if you remember from our last procedure, this is where the procedure had stopped once we were done with the anterior peritoneum and getting that closed up. Because remember, in the beginning of the um, op report, we opened those. The posterior cul de sac was open and the anterior was open. So now we're just stitching those up. And now we're moving on to repairing the bladder prolapse, which is the colporphy, meaning the vaginal repair. And it says the anterior aspect of the vaginal cuff was grass. The vaginal mucus was undermined and incised to the midline, the vesical urethral junction, to the vesical urethral junction. And this was sharply and bluntly dissected. A Kelly application stitch was placed and tied. Stitches were all placed and then subsequently tied, giving good support to the bladder. And the vaginal cuff was then closed. So closing the vaginal cuff, meaning the uterus and the cervix is gone because now the vagina, the vaginal cuff, we're closing the vagina up. So there's nothing um, at the end of this, of her vagina. There's nothing there. It's closed. And good hemostasis was noted. A small rectal seal was identified, but the decision was made to not proceed with the posterior colporphy 
as the introitus, which is the opening of the vagina. This was already narrowed by the anterior repair and was accommodating two fingers loosely. So I'm assuming she put two fingers in the vagina and she did not feel the rectum protruding in, th in there anymore. So the uh, posterior coprophy or vaginal repair or the posterior was not repaired. And it says the vagina was packed and coated with estrogen cream and was placed in the vagina and she tolerated the procedure well. So whew. then we have findings and it says it was a grade two cystal seal and a small grade one recto seal. So this is going to be very, very important to know this because this is going to change the diagnosis that we're going to use um, from what was listed up here in post-op. But then we also have to make sure we review pathology. So looking in our CPT book, this was a vaginal hysterectomy. And um, let me see, we removed the um, ovaries and the tube. And I think this one, did I list it? No, I did not list um, the weight for the uterus. So we're going to say, again, we have a vaginal hysterectomy with removal of tubes and ovaries. So that's the 58262. So I'm going to write that down. But then we also did an AMP. So that is going to be my AMP. And I find that here at repair, we are in the vagina section of our CPT book. And I went over to repairs. We have coporphes and we have an anterior coporphy repair of a cystal seal. But then there's also a posterior coporphy repair of a rectal seal. But remember, we did not do it. So we don't have to worry about reporting this. If we did, do both we are going to be looking at the combined anterior posterior coprophy. We would not be billing both of these in addition to that vaginal hysterectomy. You're only going to report the combined one. Um, but since we only did the anterior, we're looking at 57240. So I'm going to put that one underneath, 57240, and that's for our anterior repair. So when it comes down to these diagnosis codes, um, she mentioned in grade two cystocele. So I'm going to go to cyst in my book, and then I'm going to jump over for cystocele. And right here we have cystocele, which it tells us N8110, or with a prolapse of the uterus, and it says to see prolapse uterus. And then also up here, we have female, midline, paravaginal, and then if it was a pregnancy. But we don't have to worry about that. So let's go over to this prolapsed uterus because this isn't giving us that much information for the grade two cystocele. So I do have a tab for prolapse and my tabs are like so old, but I know what they say and which ones they are. So we are at prolapse and then up here we get to uterus and then you'll see indented here. You see how uterus is out some? So you wanna look for the indented areas. This will be a first degree cystocele. And I have a note here that this uterus, um, this N814 includes with a cystocele. But anyway, first degree, second degree. N81.2 is a second degree um, cystal seal. So we're going to be looking at N81.2 and then that rectal seal was already given to us and that was told to be N81.6, right? And what else? Now let's look at pathology. And pathology tells us that it was uterus with cervix that they received with bilateral fallopian tubes and bilateral ovaries. There was nothing found for the fallopian tubes, ovaries, or the myometrium. I just love when they don't find anything because then you don't have to code anything. But for the cervix, we found, um, or they found high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, SIN2 to SIN3. And how I was trained is we always go with the highest number. So instead of reporting SIN2, I'm going to report SIN3 only. 
And um, there's also a complex atypical hyperplasia or atypia hyperplasia. So let's look for that SIN3. And that's going to be right before our neoplasm table. So I'm going to... And we're going to look for SIN cervix grade 3. It says C also carcinoma cervix uteri in site 2 D069. So D069. is what you will have to write down. And if you went over there, it'll probably tell you to go to the freaking neoplasm table, which sometimes I hate that where your book sends you over into like a wild goose hunt for these codes. So let me just see what it would say. If we went to carcinoma, like it says, and we are at carcinoma cervix in site two D06.9. Okay, so it didn't say to go to the neoplasm table. It's right here, D069. <clears throat> and then our last one we needed to look up was the hyperplasia. So let's see. Hyperplasia. And we are at hyperplasia, and it is for the complex atypia. So hyperplasia, and this is a part of the endometrium, because this was listed for the endometrium. And it says, with atypia, N85.02. And then the complex one says without atypia, but this one has it. So we have to report the N85 too. So N85 too. And now we just need to figure out which codes we're going to report. And you need to make sure none of these exclude. So looking at our first prolapse codes, we have N... 81.2 and up here it tells me that N81.2 through 4 you do not report that with the N811 codes which we're not so that's good and then N812 it says excludes 1 for this code so N812 second degree Uterine prolapse, that looks good, but then we have the N81-6 right here, and it says excludes 2, this code range here. So even though it's an excludes 2 and N81.2 is listed here, I don't even know why it's an excludes 2, because I figured out that the N when you whenever you're reporting N81.2, you do not need N81.6. And I think... That was because in the very in the very front, if you were to go to maybe it was recto seal. If you went to recto seal with a uterine prolapse, you would get the N eighty one point four, but then it says with um or incomplete N81-2. So because in my mind, you're continuing to code it to the highest level, this is why the N81-2 is here. So you don't really need to code the N81-6. I think that's how we figured that out because I would have cases that I was studying and I was trying to figure out why they weren't using the N81-6. And um, let me see, where's that systole seal again? Right here, systole seal. And then that tells us to go to prolapse. So if I go to prolapse, and um, it's somewhere. Prolapse of uterus, second degree. 
Yeah, I cannot figure out where I found that. But also in my training, I was told that I don't need to report the N8016 whenever I'm reporting this one too. I cannot find it in my book where, but when I reviewed cases for the AAPC and the patient would have an incomplete cystocele and a rectocele, they did not report this code. And I was trying to figure out why not when it says it's an excludes two. And normally for excludes twos, you can report it. So I don't know, but that's why I have this note here. If N81.2, you do not need N81.6. So then for our other codes, we have the D069 and the R852. So the R852, which is here. Actually, no, it's not supposed to be two. I was looking at that like, that is wrong. It's supposed to be zero two. Um, right here is where I will find that. And it says the endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia, which is E-I-N. And I do not see any excludes for the ones that we are using. And if I come to the very beginning of N85, it says that N81, remember we're using N81 too. So that is an excludes one, but since these are going to be used on two different procedure codes, it is okay because these conditions are going to be unrelated to each other. So this is good. This is good. We just need to check that D069. D069. And right here, D069. And what did pathology say? Um, it just says cervix. It's not really specified if it was endocervix or exocervix. So we are going to go with D069. And how I link these or figured out how I should link these is my good old coding companion. I went to the 582.62 again. 82, oops, passed it. Right here, 582.62, and I'm going to look at that N91.2. It is billable for the N81.2 for this code here, so that's okay to use. And N8502. That's also okay to use. So we're good here and here. And then D069. D069 for carcinoma of cervix unspecified is not listed on here. So I'm going to have that third when I link these ones here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this one first for this code. This one second. And then this one third. And then for my anterior repair, I'm going to link the prolapse only because this is a bladder um, prolapse or cystocele. And that's why we did the anterior repair. Remember, our code says repair of a cystocele. So that's why I'm going to link that one only to this code here. But if we wanted to look over here, just to see, like, oh, well, could you use the other codes? Uh, 572 40, which is here, and these are the codes that you are given. So, N81. Oh, wow, N81.2 is not even on here for an incomplete, but it's okay because we are going to use it anyway. That's what the patient had. And look, N81.4 wasn't on here either. And that's what the post-op diagnosis code was. So if I were to receive a denial for this, I will be surprised because they even have a cystocele unspecified here. But um, this is just what Optum 
360 says the diagnosis codes are for. So don't feel as though you only can get a claim paid if you're using these diagnosis codes only, because I'm pretty sure they're going to pay it, even if I'm using the N81.2. So that is it, you guys. I feel like I need to go get a drink of water because my mouth is so dry right now. And yeah, that is, oh, I almost forgot. We have two procedures here, and I just looked at my screen, that's why. Um, we would need to report the modifier 51 code on the procedure, on the second procedure. So the one that has the highest RVUs, I will link first, which is going to be the 582.62 or the uh, highest dollar amount I'm going to list first. And then this one was second in line. And I applied and I put on that um, modifier 51. So if I were to go over to my appendix A section and my CPT, I want to turn the page because right there is where it says 50, 51 for multiple procedures. And it says here, the additional procedure services may be identified by appending modifier 51. And yeah, you do not need modifier 51 on add-on codes. Um, but yeah, that's all I have for this video, you guys. Make sure you give it a thumbs up. Comment down below if you enjoyed it, if you liked how long it is this time. And I will see you all in my next one. Bye.